we are a member of the European Union, and we are now a member of the European <coughs> Union, the, those people who are not British citizens, but who are citizens of another European Union country, have a legal status which has its own kind of um, social implications, and the social implications are felt inwardly by the people, and they're also experienced more generally in, in social debate. And there's, there's, some, there's some lovely research that's been done by Michaela Benson, for instance, about the way that British patients who are being cared for in the Spanish health system, relying on their European Union law rights, feel about their relationships with the UK, about their relationships with the EU, about their relationships with Spain. And there's also some detailed, really techy research that we are doing about their legal entitlements and how those legal entitlements will change post-Brexit depending on what kind of Brexit we get. And there are also really important different time frames. So there'll be different legal entitlements during the time that a withdrawal agreement applies then there may be another type of transition to do with the, the way that the European Union's social security coordination works and pensions and so on, which will be for the lifetime of the people who are, have been in the European Union. And then there'll be another period after that. Why am I talking about this detail? Because the legal entitlements, the legal position, and the way people then therefore feel, how secure they feel, and what decisions they then make based on how they feel, not just on what their rights actually are, those legal entitlements will be really difficult to understand and follow. And that's part of the insecurity and the uncertainty that's making me very concerned about what are the fallouts from Brexit for the NHS and for the people within it. I don't think that's project fear. I think that's project reality. And I think one of the really important things that we can do is be very explicit about how complicated it is. Um, one of the things that our government wants to reassure with is it's all going to be fine. It's all very simple. There are simple solutions to all of these problems. There may well be solutions to these problems, but I don't think any of them are simple. And that brings me to the second thing that I want to say very briefly, which is that this will take time. So legal instruments take time to write. Legal agreements between countries, legal agreements between organisations take time to write, to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're not having unintended consequences, that the legal text doesn't do something that you don't want it to do. And of course, one of the difficulties with the Brexit process is that there isn't time. There is a legal limit to the amount of time the UK has to sort out the very many things that it has to sort out. The NHS reforms in England introduced marketisation and having done so, and as Mark from the Nuffield Trust pointed out, that then brought aspects of healthcare within competition law. There was no need to do that. That hasn't happened in Denmark, it hasn't happened in much of Spain or Portugal, it, has happened, it hasn't happened to any great degree in Sweden, and it hasn't happened in Scotland, which I, you know, to this largely English audience, I would just point out, is also part of the European Union. There was nothing inevitable about it whatsoever. So while I agree with the vast majority of the criticism uh, that was made, that is completely irrelevant to this debate, I'm afraid. What about looking forward? Well, I'm actually quite um, unconcerned about certain things because it is now abundantly clear with the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, who has not visited Brussels in three months, a government that had produced a white paper which lived up to its name by having six pages that were entirely white and another six pages that were grey and was full of mistakes and was described on Twitter as being like the work of a caffeine-crazed intern, which we know now was finished at 4 a.m. in the morning it was published with speeches by ministers that are deliberately ambiguous to keep, her party, keep the party together, that we have made absolutely no progress whatsoever. We also know, and Tammy normally points this out, 
that any agreement has to be compliant with the treaties. Now, I know this is a difficult concept in a country which does not have a written constitution, like most of the rest of the world, with the, possible, except with the exception of New Zealand. But most other governments and most other people recognise that you can only act within the constitution, the treaties, whatever. And there are courts that will call you out if you do not do that. So therefore, Michel Barnier has produced a very helpful diagram of steps that many of you will have seen, which says that if the British government has particular red lines, then it is at a different point on the steps. And the present red lines it has are in this model of either crashing out or uh, the uh, South Korean-Canadian model, which will take years to negotiate. And in fact, people have looked in detail at some of the issues that need to be negotiated. Take a tiny little bit, it will be months and months, so we don't have that time. So essentially, it's pretty obvious that we're going to go into a virtually indefinite transition period, which will be much the same as it is now, which is fine. The UK won't have a say, it will pay money in, that's fine, but we'll be much the same. Or we crash out, and if we crash out, it will be for a matter of weeks because, frankly, we will starve. The food security issue will be the biggest problem as the 75,000 trucks from the UK that currently take food and other things across onto the uh, roads of Europe um, have to compete for 1,200 permits, have to renew all of their licenses and so on. So that's not going to be lasting for any length of time. On the other hand, I do have some worries, and the worries are threefold. One, we now know from the government's own impact assessment that under any scenario we will be worse off and we all know that the NHS is struggling already. And they can argue that they haven't modelled the government's prepared approach because that's because it's not possible to model it because it's a complete fantasy. The second issue is staffing. And even if, they, even if EU workers retain all of the rights that they now have, will they want to come to a country which is now so replete with uh, xenophobia and with racism and with hatred and who, where their money is um, worth less than it was? I doubt it. And we've already seen the number of nurses falling off a cliff. And the third issue, and an issue where I also agree with Lord Owen, I'm totally in favour of repealing the Health and Social Care Act. And actually many leaders of the NHS are as well. Because the, the current proposals for integration, um, whether we call them accountable care organisations or whatever, the integration is the way forward, but it is probably not possible to do it within the current legislation. But there isn't the vaguest possibility of finding parliamentary time to do that at the minute. Mm -hmm. And as was reported yesterday, this has been the least active parliamentary period in recorded history. So we need to change, repeal the Act. Many people agree it needs to be changed. It's just simply not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is Brexit. Two things, if I may, to focus on. I think, I think the first, uh, the, the two types of people uh, that you've asked us to talk about. I think the first, in terms of the people who work uh, within care, I would, like Tammy, broaden the definition, and I'd broaden it, broaden it even further. It includes healthcare. Um, yes, the NHS is the biggest statutory provider of um, healthcare um, in the world, and uh, you know is, is is a significant force in healthcare in this country. But there are really important private parts of healthcare, many funded by the NHS: general practice, dentists, mm -hmm. pharmacists. Uh, work alongside us, as well as colleagues in the private sector who provide care. Uh, I would include life sciences, pharmacy and mm -hmm. technology in particular, because those industries, mm -hmm. as well as colleagues in academia, are really important parts of, of how we help our patients. And I would in particularly include our colleagues in social care. Um, as recent years have shown, our fate, our destiny in the NHS is absolutely entwined uh, with our colleagues in social care. And whilst we experience the kind of profound disinvestment that we've seen in social care in this country in the last uh, seven years or more, then actually we suffer and our patients um, suffer as well. Um, the second thing I'd, I'd highlight is that actually the impact on citizens is profound. And whilst we in the NHS welcome the commitment on behalf of both the European Union and the UK government to try and find a way to maintain reciprocal arrangements for healthcare, we all wonder how that's going to work in practice. Tammy said far more eloquently than I could. And clearly there are significant issues about how the public in this country, citizens in this country, continue to access um, cutting edge care, innovative care, in ways in which um, the European arrangements facilitate and support, whether that's through research, whether that's through mutual recognition of technology and, and um, drugs and so on. There are real questions about how that's going to work in, in practice. To focus on the bit that see, I've got a particular responsibility for, which is the people who work within health and social care. Um, we have formed a, a coalition across health and social care across the four countries called the Cavendish Coalition. There are three things we're particularly interested in, and I'll dwell on the third one in particular if I may. The first is about certainty. 
um, uh, for our EU colleagues who currently work with us. 7% of the NHS workforce are EU nationals, probably more than 15% within London are EU nationals. Uh, the second thing we're interested in is migration policy full stop. What will migration policy look like after we leave the European Union, if we leave the European Union? Um, another 7% of the NHS workforce are drawn from outside the EU. Mm. And one of the things we find, uh, particularly at the moment, is that uh, actually as we look to recruit, as we recruit fewer people from within the European Union, we start to recruit more people from outside the European Union, and we find that increasingly we have fewer and fewer work permits available mm. to recruit those people from outside the European Union. And the NHS is the single biggest yeah. consumer of tier two work permits yeah. in the country. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a real question there about our long-term migration policy. And the third thing is about domestic supply. You know, how, how do we make sure that our sector is an attractive employer in what will be a much more competitive job market um, as we leave the European Union? We have real questions and real concerns about how that second bit works in particular. I, I suspected until the current problems that we're having with tier two visas that the, the professionals within the NHS might be, might be okay. The bit that we really worry about though um, and that system isn't fit for purpose at the moment, but the bit we really worry about are the people who aren't professionals, mm -hmm. who aren't registered with the GMC or the GDC or the NMC or anyone else. They're the army of people who in particular are concentrated in social care, who are drawn from within the European Union and increasingly from outside the European Union. They are the mm -hmm. care workers, the domiciliary staff, uh, the people who keep particularly our elders uh, functioning in our, our communities in, in, the, in the best way that they can. And our colleagues in social care are utterly reliant on those on those colleagues, and I think policymakers are struggling to devise a migration system that recognises the worth of those people and the mm -hmm. contribution they make. And that's the biggest single concern that, mm -hmm. that we have in the NHS. We don't employ as many of those uh, colleagues within the NHS, but as I said earlier, we, we rely on them totally uh, in terms of the contribution they make in our communities. So what uh, we think is needed is to clarify that at the moment, you know, a lot of the uh, mm, the risks that the, at the beginning of the Brexit uh, uh, workers were dreading may not happen because the uh, negotiations are going very well in the aspect of uh, uh, the contributions being aggregated in the future, the pensions always have been, the NHS uh, pension, the superannuation has been always paid abroad, so it's out of the Brexit uh, negotiation because it's as an occupational pension. And regarding the state pension, there was a bilateral agreement before, and now they have agreed that they will be respected and aggregated. So this is I think something that can reassure the, the staff. The problem will be with the new immigration policy, obviously, obviously because if they put, like, uh, with the tiers, they put salaries, the social care uh, employees have very uh, low salaries, so they will never be able to come into the country unless there is a program uh, from you know Spain, for example, and the UK, to allow uh, social care people to come, or the, re the salaries are, are raised because it's an important <coughs> sector and probably is underpaid. Uh, so I suppose that uh, instead of maybe all negative, uh, it could be that something positive can come out of this, you know, that the, uh, there is a good immigration, a good program uh, policy, especially for the key workers, and uh, probably we can see the problem, and it has been on the press, that for our Spanish uh, staff, the problem is the language, that they are not very well prepared, and they have the barrier, na the barrier now of the ILTS. Mm -hmm. So this has stopped a lot of nurses, because it's a challenge uh, to, to pass these exams. I don't know if that's the case. Thank you. Th th there's a number of um, really helpful points there. I mean, I, th I think the first is you're right, and, and within the NHS we've um, particularly tried to emphasise the progress that has been made around certainty, particularly for the people who are already working with us. And, and, and you're right, there's, there's a risk that um, in the debate that we have at events like this, we, we, we kind of describe all the problems that are outstanding and we, we kind of go past some of the things that have been achieved. So that you, I don't underestimate that, and I don't underestimate the importance of that to the thousands of staff we've got from Spain and, and Portugal and Ireland and other places that work within the NHS. 
I think the the second point you make uh, about um, the long-term migration policy, if, if we have a migration policy that is in any way based upon the policy that we have now, uh, that, that, that really worries us. You know, and you're absolutely right. We have a policy at the moment that equates <coughs> salary, high <coughs> earnings, with value to the, to the country and value to the economy. And that, that, that just isn't fit for purpose. That's why we had to put nurses on the shortage occupation list a couple of years ago. Uh, it may well be why doctors even end up um, needing to have special measures so we can recruit sufficient doctors from outside the European Union. So there are, there are some real tensions in the policy that we've got described. And, and clearly, if as a country uh, our politicians believe that what we need is greater control over migration policy, they need to have a far more sophisticated approach to, to, to dealing with that than, than we have at, at present. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, one of, the, one of the, the difficulties about the current narrative about migration policy is it's not just that it's about control, it's also about numbers. So unless that changes, you know, you have, you have various ministerial statements about what the target numbers of immigrants will be over time. And that's just completely to misconceive and misunderstand the way that human migration works and, and supports organisations like the NHS or social care and so on. And it's not even entirely negative for the sending countries. So, for instance, Spain has had a, a really good experience of sending its nurses to the UK to be trained, and then they come home later in their careers. So that's actually been, every, you know, everybody wins in, in a way. Um, it, it isn't just a brain drain thing. It's much more complicated than that. Yeah, could I just remind people that key workers have families? They're family members that they would like to be with. And we're not in the days whenever we would send people off to the colonies on their own and their children would stay at boarding school in England and, and vice versa. Uh, so I think we need to remember that people move um, with a package of rights that is insured under European law. And that applies to them moving money and other family members if they have aged family members mm -hmm. who they would otherwise be caring for uh, that would have to stay in the countries that they're coming from. Um, there are huge challenges that invo are involved, and as Tammy has pointed out, all of these things work because they're underpinned by European law on data protection, on citizens' rights, and all sorts of other things. You lose that, and it falls apart very quickly, and you see that in particular with the cross-border arrangements in Ireland, uh, which are underpinned by that. Now, I agree that there are pre-existing agreements with a number of countries. And when I was giving evidence to the Lords EU Committee um, on this, I went into great detail to look at those agreements. And um, I think uh, probably in a way that nobody has done for quite some time. And they're very revealing in what they say, because we do have excellent agreements with the Soviet Union, with Czechoslovakia, with Yugoslavia, if only those countries still existed. And those countries give great <coughs> rights to posted workers abroad who will receive certain rights if they travel abroad, and in some cases, their wives might too. Because in those agreements, the idea that a single woman might ever go abroad to work is actually unimaginable. It's as if Florence Nightingale had never existed. So while those, real, those um, agreements might, be of some, might have been of some use in the 1930s and 40s, they're of much less use now. But as I say, the point is that they're underpinned by a large body of EU law, and we lose that, and we've got problems. And that is why this government in this country does not want to get into the detail, because the detail is, is um, where the problems really lie. Thank you. Can I just, I think there's a, first of all, lady at the back four, and I just, there's a sense of yes. Uh, is, I've, I've got the microphone, yeah. is that all right? Yes, absolutely, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to raise three practical challenges. I work for the national patient support charity called Kidney Care UK. So the first one is around the eHIT card. So there are people on dialysis at the moment who will not be able to travel across to the EU anymore and receive their treatment as they do in this country, free of charge, where the resources are available, unless we can sort out the reciprocal healthcare care arrangements. The second point is uh, around organ donation. So where organs are donated in an EU country or indeed here, and they cannot be used in the country of origin, which is rare, but it does happen. There are and that's very, very precious, as you can imagine. We need to sort out our arrangements, our public health and, and organ movement arrangements, because those things cannot wait in customs while the, you know, the 28 countries argue about what they're going to do. And the third point is really around uh, research and drug availability, particularly for people with rare diseases, where there'll be small groups in each country that come together and actually you know, can develop better treatments and also then the, the drug companies will be encouraged to 
to invest in, in the right drugs, etc. And we cannot afford to lose any of those things when we go forward. So I'd really like to hear what people think of those issues. If you want. I'll do EHIC if you want. I was going to say something about EHIC too in the North Africa. Yes. So on the EHIC, um, I mean, everybody says, well, we all want it to work and we'll find a way to make it work. But actually, it comes under social security legislation. And, uh, and this may be a disappointment for some of the younger people in the audience because you might think that, in fact, the EHIC was put in place so that if you go on a, a stag or a hen party in Prague and you fall over, somebody will pick you up. It wasn't actually for that purpose. It was for the purpose of promoting. I know, uh, disappointing, I know, but it was for the purpose of labour mobility. And if you do not have free movement, you lose the legal basis. But then you say, well, surely we can make it work. But the area where we have tried, where the European Union has tried to make it work, and everybody has tried to make it work, is under social security legislation in relation to pensions for people moving between Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and mainly to France. Because everybody agrees that would be a good idea. We should be able to make that work. And the parties involved have been trying to make it work for 20 years, and they have failed to do so. There are individual bilateral arrangements, like between Spain and Portugal and some of the South American countries, but not on a European-wide basis because you do not have the treaty competence. And that keeps coming back to the point that this has to be compliant with the treaty, otherwise it will not work. The organs, very good point. So the British government's argument is, trust us that we will ensure all of the same um, provisions for biosafety and freedom from viruses and all sorts of other things, um, even though we will not be under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice if something goes wrong. This is coming from a country which created BSE. People have long memories, but we're meant to be trusted even though we're the country where that actually uh, arose. Um, other people will, will talk about, uh, about the research, but I would point out that we now have 24 European reference networks um, for the treatment of people with rare conditions, and the UK is a partner in most of those. That cannot continue once we leave unless we loosen our, our red lines. Uh, so, um, yeah, sure, everybody says we'll find a solution, but ask the Tunisians and the Algerians and the Moroccans. They've been trying to find a solution for 20 years. If it's not in the treaty, it is not going to happen. If I could just add to that about EHIC. So the draft Commission, European Commission text for the withdrawal agreement has a whole section about coordination of social security under the withdrawal agreement. And there is one way of reading that legal text. I spent a whole weekend on this recently. There's one way of reading that legal text that suggests that everybody who is currently entitled to an EHIC will continue to be entitled to an EHIC. There's another way of reading the text that isn't that. So one of the things that would mm, be yeah. really good would be if the British government would clarify yeah. which is the correct reading of the text. There's nothing explicit about the EHIC in there. It'd be quite nice to have something explicit too. In fact, I've drafted a little clause for them if they would like it. Mm. It's there. So it's clarity at that granular level that we need so that your kidney patients know, can I go on holiday yeah. to Italy like I have for the last five years? That's part mm. of my dignity that's part of my sense of who I am, yeah. And we'd quite like Tammy's um, clause to be in certain sense there's certainty around EHIC, and you know, that's clearly what patient groups we tell us, you know, we're we absolute consensus like there. Yeah. yeah, there's no clarity, no, no clarity. My goals will be nice to speak. My goals were there. My goals were there. Oh yeah, sorry, who <laughs> do, who come? Hi, Mike Goldsworthy, scientist for EU and Healthier In. A question about the tone rather than technicalities. Uh, with EU nurses currently um, here, they do not have to do the English language test and yet their leaving rate has shot up by 67%. Um, similarly, within the science community, uh, we are having hiring problems now and, and seeing um, EU staff dropping off. Uh, with doctors in the NHS, surveys have shown that more and more are making plans to leave, actually making plans to leave, reasons being not feeling welcome here. And also as scientists for EU, we did a survey after the referendum that showed lots of concerns about xenophobia, not feeling welcome here, and the difference in tone between being in the lab and being out in wider society. 
So how do we work on not just the technicalities, but also the tone? I do get concerned when I, when I come in and I hear Lord Owen say, um, well, why are scientists making a fuss? Everything will be all right, the money will be there. And absolutely missing the community tone that is already doing damage to our country, both in terms of staffing and already collaborations. And similarly within the NHS, when you have Julia Hartley Brewer uh, grilling a GP saying, well, if these people don't know that they're gonna be protected, well, maybe we don't want them here anyway. And this kind of language also does not recognize the bubbling anxieties that are going on and until we can turn around that tone, as perceived by the actual staff, we are going to have problems retaining them and also attracting them. So how do we start turning around that uh, sentiment? So, uh, I mean, the answer that, that we perceive in the NHS is that we have to take some responsibility for that ourselves. So we are still recruiting the same number of doctors uh, from within the European Union as we did before the country voted to, to leave the European Union. Uh, we're making different decisions about recruiting other staff from within the EU, and our employers are making different decisions. Some of that is to do with the language testing, as a colleague from the Spanish Embassy described earlier. Some of that is to do with the fact that actually as economies in other countries pick up, their nurses don't necessarily want to come and work mm. in the English NHS or the Scottish NHS, wherever it may be. They prefer to stay in Spain or Portugal, wherever, wherever it may be. And some of it is actually whilst we've had that uncertainty, it's been harder to offer jobs to nurses than it has to has been to doctors, and that's something about our migration system overall, and that mm. higher earners have more certainty. But our bit, as the largest employer in the country, what we're trying to do is reassure our employees and the people we want to recruit to come and work for us. And you're absolutely right, part of that is about trying to fight back against a perception about what it's like to come and work and live in this country uh, in the period since the, since the referendum. But we've all got to take some responsibility for that, for that ourselves in, in terms of employers, and we have to you know, frankly, love those colleagues to, to death. Um, I've, we've, we've done some joint work with university colleagues. I think universities in particular have done some fantastic work in terms of trying to give information and reassurance to, to colleagues and to, to try and remain attractive uh, because we absolutely want talented people from around the world to come and, come and work with us. It's very interesting to compare the tone that comes from Nicola Sturgeon about the notion oh. of Scotland as an open country and a tolerant country and one that loves its non-Scots compared to the language in England. And just one other thing we need to remember, that uh, in creating a climate hostile to migrants, which is government policy in England, uh, we, there are a lot of people who believe that they're not migrants because they've been living here for very many years, like the gentleman who was reported recently with advanced prostate cancer, who came from Jamaica as a child and was denied treatment. One in six people who've been living in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom all their lives do not have passports. We've been working with doctors of the world and some of the most incredible stories of people being denied treatment even though they've been here all their life worked in the NHS and contributed to it. So uh, again, without invoking the historical parallels too much, for those who want migrants to go home, they need to remember that um, sometime they may not have all the documentation or have the ability to demonstrate their right to treatment and they may find themselves in the same position as um, some of the people that we're now seeing who felt and believed and contributed that they were part of this country contributed to it and are now being denied the benefits. Thank you. Some, some more questions. Uh, a gentleman there and then the lady there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Coming. <laughs> Um, thanks very much. Roger Jones, I'm the editor of the British Journal of General Practice. It would be really interesting and helpful if Martin McKee could spell out a couple of things that were in his letter to the Times <laughs> on Monday. The um, health protections mm. that have been required in the amendment mm. to the bill, because that kind of crosses yeah. a lot of these sure. dis discussions. So for the non-experts, including me, could you help us with that. Yeah, I mean, th this was a letter that we wrote in support of the amendment in the Lords. I was interested to hear that Lord Owen will not be voting for any amendments that arise in the Lords. And this is being put forward by Lord Hunt from Labour and Baroness Jolly from the Lib Dems and, and um, Lord um, Patel and, forgive me, I've briefly forgotten. Um, but on a cross bend and a cross party uh, way. And what this would do would be simply to transpose the existing protect health protections for health that are in the EU treaty, which say that a high level of health shall be part of all European policies, which has been very important in European Court of Justice rulings, and that was taken into account in rulings in many public health issues, which say it's not just about trade, 
trade decisions, all these other decisions need to take account of health, health um, in terms of competition. Uh, if we look at the cross-border uh, care of patients, uh, health uh, was always taken into account by the European Court of Justice and the courts. Now, whenever the powers are repatriated to the UK, we are simply saying that that protection of health, that particular status, that the government should do nothing which would damage health in any of the legislation that it enacts under its Henry VIII powers and so on, that should be retained. That letter was signed by, and we were quite selective, but it's been signed by the overwhelming majority of heads of um, British medical schools and it's been signed by a number of other former presidents of royal colleges and so on. So it's very much leaders, and it was the elite. You know, I accept that. These are people that are the elite. We could have got thousands of signatories, as was done, in fact, with the um, letter for academics, where, you know, there were 30-odd people who, uh, academics, who said they, they wanted to leave, and within three days, um, over a thousand, 1,400, I think, um, signed a letter saying the opposite. You could have got hundreds, but um, this was simply saying, let us please support that amendment. And if you believe that health is important, which I guess many of us do, we can see no reason why the government should reject an amendment to the EU withdrawal bill that simply says, whenever those powers are brought back into domestic legislation, it must take due account of health and should not do anything which deliberately damages it. I think that's pretty reasonable. And I should say, Tammy and uh, us also played a, a key role with, in, in terms of putting the, the wording together on that. Is that enough clarification? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I mean, that's, that's, one of, that's one of the questions. Is it just symbolic? I mean, is it just symbolic? It's actually important to have symbols to go to the question about oh. tone. So symbols do matter. But would it, would it have an effect? Yes, potentially. So there are equivalents in existing law that constrain ministerial power, also constrain power in the devolves, actually, yep. though we're not so mm. worried about what the devolves are doing in health, really. Um, so, so you could actually have ministerial acts overturned in the courts for not complying with this provision. So it would, it's intended to have some legal bite, but its, its main intention is symbolic. I mean, if you are worried about chlorine-washed chicken, and hormone-treated beef and all of these other things, then I would suggest it's better to have a, prote a health protection somewhere in, in British law uh, that would... Um, and that was one of the reasons why TTIP actually collapsed, because <coughs> of the problems with um, the risk that it could have undermined public health. I'm very conscious, first of all, the gentleman's waiting there. Please take um, Reference uh, money uh, for medical services in Britain. I'm an Englishman, this is England. Uh, charity begins and continues at home here, okay? With all due respects to everywhere else in the world, okay? Um, if people are so concerned with uh, helping the rest uh, uh, of the world, fine, but they keep it personal, use their own finances and go where they feel they are wanted. Back on the uh, road here in England, uh, uh, and I asked the question, is the professions of being a doctor and a nurse fully uh, advertised to the public? Because time was in the past when it was, uh, when it was uh, an admirable profession to be a doctor or a nurse. And I hear all the complexities and the difficulties in the news uh, that we're experiencing today. Uh, are doctors and nurses paid fully uh, for their work or not? Finished. Um, so the, the two points you raised there, sir. I mean, I, I think that the first point in, in terms of access to healthcare, you know, far more uh, UK citizens access healthcare through the EU system in continental Europe uh, than EU citizens access healthcare within this uh, within this within this country. So, EHIC uh, is a is a net benefit. UK citizens are net beneficiaries of the EHIC arrangement, um, and that's you know, to do with the pattern of lifestyle choices that people make in terms of where they move, as well as stag do's in Prague and other mm. European cities and everything else. Um, the second point about, um, I guess, what lies behind your question is is why uh, is the United Kingdom. Um, uh, to an extent dependent on overseas labour in its NHS. It, it always has been. Um, it's not a new feature. In our 70-year history in an NH as an NHS, um, we have uh, recruited people from different parts of the world at, at, at different times. That's usually a function of the fact that we've got our plans wrong, uh, in fairness. 
What we do see is a desire to increase uh, domestic participation in medicine in particular. The government has announced um, a fairly dramatic expansion in medical school places. That's welcome. That, that will um, reduce uh, some of our need to recruit uh, doctors from elsewhere in the world. It, of course, takes five years to go to medical school and another 10 to 15 years to train postgraduately to become a consultant or a general practitioner. So we, we will feel the benefit of that investment, but we probably won't feel the benefit of that investment for another 10 or 20 years. Um, similarly, though, I would also say, and I, I guess this lies partly behind the question we were asked about science, I believe that the NHS benefits by bringing in talented people from around the world. I also believe that people who work within the NHS and people I've worked with, clinicians that I've worked with, benefit from being able to work in different parts of the world. Um, and actually to have uh, a system in our country that permits people uh, to come and work with us also means that countries are going to be more prepared to allow our people to go and practice in their systems and to bring those benefits back to our, mm -hmm. our patients um, and our citizens. I'm conscious the lady's been waiting for quite a long while, actually, there. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Philippa Whitford. I'm the SNP Health spokesperson uh, at Westminster. Delighted to hear so much discussion uh, of Scotland so far this morning. Um, just two points. One, talking about the fact that Europe is based on legislation, on legal structures. And if we look at the last month, what we've seen from the UK is lots of speeches some of them a bit better than others, but still vague. There's still a few unicorns running around and still quite a lot of cake and eat it. On the other side, what we see are papers, proposals, <coughs> guidelines. And while we have this complete disconnect, 20 months on from the referendum, literally the egg timer is counting down. And that's a real concern, that we are not, in this country, boiling down to the detail. The other one is, I think, of course, there's lots of challenges around health reciprocity and, and drugs and so on. I think the biggest single one in the next decade is around immigration and the, both the tone and the plan around immigration. When people say migrants go home, why don't the EU people go home if, we don't, if they don't like it here? My husband's been a GP in the NHS here for 32 years. He is home. This is his home. And I think that kind of language has really been damaging. And when I attended events of the Cavendish Coalition uh, in Westminster, I was meeting people whose children are being bullied. Yeah. There's only so much of that that you will put up with. And while we may get certainty for people who are already here and UK nationals who are already in Europe, we know that the turnaround <coughs> of nurses is usually around 25%. Yeah. And so it will be particularly in the future and particularly after transition, that's when we'll really see the fall off because over time, people will be concerned. And if someone is not coming here as a consultant, but as a trainee, they will need that 10 to 15 years. And the ECJ will only protect them for eight years. Yeah. So they want to come here, but they envisage their entire future being here. And that's something that a lot of them will feel that they can't, can't count on. <coughs> Crazy. Nothing to add. <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, this next there. The gentleman in the middle yeah. Hi there. Um, I'm not a great brain. I'm not a hugely influential person. But how do I get a say in influencing what goes on? Because we've heard all the pros and cons. How do we make this government pressurised by everyone here and everyone who has an opinion to actually make decisions. Not if you're a professor or um, leading a hugely important organisation, but who is a normal person to make sure we put pressure on them to make the right decisions. I well, could give a constitutional law answer to that. I don't suppose you want that. I mean, we're all represented by our MPs, so that's, that is one way in. And many, many people who care about the effects of Brexit in health and in, uh, in other contexts are engaging their MPs directly. Unfortunately, the way that party politics works in this country, <coughs> Leave Remain doesn't map to political parties. 
So that does make it a particularly difficult problem in terms of constitutional accountability in, in, this, in this country that you've put your finger right on. That, that's my kind of starter for 10 law 101 type answer. Yeah, uh, well, one answer is to join the cabinet because that's the only place any meaningful discussions are taking place. I mean, they're if deadlocked they if they are, um, but they're not getting anywhere. But until we have an agreement within the cabinet, um, or more to the point, the Brexit subcommittee, which I would point out um, is not attended by Jeremy Hunt, he is not a member of that, which is completely different than in a number of other Euro of our other member states where health has a very prominent position in Ireland, in Malta, elsewhere, where they take it very, very seriously. But we've decided to. Prioritise it, but the other obvious answer is that there are elections coming up for many of us in May, uh, in May of this year. And although you're right that the two main parties are hopelessly divided on this, uh, there are many other, there are several other parties that are not um, divided, and uh, you may want to decide where to uh, place your vote on the basis of that. This isn't the answer at the individual citizen level, but 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 in terms of us as a sector, I think we've accepted. Um, that we've not been good enough at speaking with, with one voice, um, that we've, we've allowed um, sometimes separate uh, cases to be made between the different countries. You know, there are four NHSs within the United Kingdom in, in, in each of the, the four nations. Uh, there's something about actually making sure that employers and trade unions make common cause together. There's also something particularly for us about making sure that we make common cause with our colleagues in social care, mm -hmm. so that when we speak to the government, we speak as far as possible with one voice as particularly including our colleagues as social carers, the, as the single biggest group of employers within the country. There's also something about making common cause with other sectors. So we are doing a lot of work at the moment in terms of um, building that relationship, with, particularly with pharma and yes. medtech, because they're, they're really important partners of ours. Yeah. But we're also making common cause with people like the CBI and the Institute of Directors, because actually we face, whilst we have some unique problems, we face some many common problems, particularly around immigration policy. And I think that is that, you know, it's, it's this, this whole process has, has brought people together in lots of unexpected ways. Um, and there is th there's real importance in that clarity and that impact of message, hopefully, with, with government, albeit, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to know where to pitch uh, the point that, that one is making, because the policy isn't just being made within the Home Office around migration or the Department for Exiting the EU or, or in the health, Department of Health and Social Care. It's, 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 a, it's a much more complex um, kind of terrain that we're having to deal with as we try and interact with, with government. Uh, and the lack of clarity that, that Philippa talked with isn't helping that either because no. one would like more to actually kind of comment on that, that's credible, um, that um, you can engage with. The delay in the white paper on migration, for example, is a real concern to us. That was meant to be published uh, a month ago. Um, so we, you know, we're waiting for some substantive things that we feel then we can help and contribute to. But that coming together as far as possible um, is the thing that we've we've worked hard on in this in this last twenty months. Lady up there, thank you. The mic's coming round. Uh, thank you. My name's Jerry. I work at King's College London in the Faculty of Nursing. Um, with workforce, there is the issue, obviously, of EU nurse numbers registering with the, the NMC decreasing. But a bigger issue which hasn't really been addressed, um, which is a local issue, but has a huge impact on the NHS, is with the loss of the bursaries for student nurses. Our numbers are down 25%. So Jeremy Hunt says, grow your own, and then takes away the bursaries. So we have less people wanting to do nursing. Um, and recently, which sort of slid under with, um, to uh, anybody's attention, was the postgraduate diploma nurses who also used to get bursaries, they were taken away. Um, nursing is very different from other um, undergraduates, where a lot of them are older, single parents, um, and it's something they're passionate about. And the good old days where nursing was a vocation is gone. It is a career. And I find it really insulting that someone thinks you can just get someone off the street to go in and become a nurse, yeah, just fill that gap. Um, it's actually quite skillful. Um, we do quite a lot of assessments, clinical decision making, and we prescribe. Um, the new NMC standards for undergraduates is extremely thorough. Um, also, one in three nurses are entitled to retire within the next five years. So we have these compounding issues. And if, if people don't realise, the NHS will stand for no hope of service because we will not have the staff to, to actually d deliver the service. 
So clearly, we, we are in a position at the moment where we're in effect when, when George Osborne gave extra money to NHS England to spend on frontline front line services. He took that money out of various training budgets that the NHS had. And, and that, that wasn't just the undergraduate budget. There were other places as well. I think there's something more complicated going on, actually, in terms of applications for nursing, because we've also <laughs> seen applications for nursing places fall in those devolved administrations where they still do pay the bursary. So there is something that I think, um, and I know your faculty is engaged in this work, you know, the, 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 there are things that we need to look at in terms of the image and, um, and attractiveness of both the profession, but also us, frankly, as a group of employers, in terms of um, becoming more competitive as we, as we go forward. Um, the bursary may well play a part, and I think it probably, uh, we have particular concerns, as you do, about the, the diversity of supply that we have, particularly in terms of attracting uh, people who may be pursuing second or third careers. But we do need to understand what's happened in those devolved administrations who pursued a different path doing them, but are also seeing a fall in, in application. So there's something that between the profession uh, and between us as employers across the United Kingdom, we need to think about very differently in terms of how we market a career, frankly, and make attractive a career, whether it's in the profession of nursing or in other roles that we have. Um, and I think we've got a lot more to do as employers in that, in that respect. Gentleman up there, and, uh, and then the lady, uh, Nicola, there, so you're in order first, I think. Hi, I'm Sam Alvis from the Wellcome Trust. We do um, a lot of work on Brexit implications for biomedical research as a whole. Um, one thing I, I think is sort of missing from the debate is the implications for some of the areas that the UK is very good at um, as a devolved competency, things like genomics, uh, mitochondrial donation, and genome editing. And actually, in the future, we could see patients crossing borders a lot more as opposed to medicines crossing borders. Um, and unfortunately, this focus on the immediate impact <coughs> of Brexit has sort of is meant we haven't been talking about that as much. I wonder if the panel had any views on how the UK might want to talk about that within the negotiations and whether the EU might want to talk it for the benefit of their citizens as well. Well, I, I did mention the European reference networks, um, which are an opportunity to do that. And uh, these networks combine research, training, guidelines, and, um, and patient care. And uh, there is currently, uh, in the recent council conclusions, a discussion about expanding them beyond rare diseases. And in fact, I'm chairing a working group within the European Commission's expert panel on health, which is looking at precisely this at the minute. Uh, so that would have been a great opportunity to do that, uh, but unfortunately it's an opportunity that will be denied to patients with rare conditions or other uh, complex conditions in the United Kingdom because it's very difficult to see how this can happen without the underpinning of EU law that makes it all possible. But I agree, it's a great worry. I mean, I guess to try to be a little bit more optimistic, mm. this is not easy for me. Um, the, I should, should say, not because I'm not an optimistic person, I am an optimistic person, but because Brexit is really bad for health, you know, across a range of things. If the UK can negotiate some kind of relationship with Horizon 2020 or Framework Programme 9, maybe they can negotiate, we can negotiate some kind of relationship with the European Reference Networks uh -huh. system. That is going to cost. We will be an associate member. We will almost certainly not be allowed to lead European Reference uh -huh. Networks projects, but we could be part of them. That might be a way for that. And, and your point suggest that we have something to bring to that negotiation because we have our capacity and our expertise in those particular fields. So that, that kind of thing could be done. But my point from before stands that the, the technical arrangements, the, the law, mm -hmm. the contracts that sit underneath that mm -hmm. all need to be negotiated and agreed. You know, at the same time as every other sector is also saying, oh, but we need a special deal for, for, for our sector. And, uh, yeah. okay. yes. Thank you. Um, Nicola Weil from the General Medical Council. Um, so just to raise another workforce issue as well. We've spoken about the visa system, we've spoken about training doctors and nurses, but then there's also the way that doctors get onto the medical register. Yeah. So at the moment, if you're a European doctor, you have a, a valid medical qualification. You can come onto the UK medical register relatively automatically, it takes about a month's time. 
If you're an international doctor, it can take anything up to about 18 months to get onto the medical register. So there's the kind of, the, the, the flow, the pipeline of doctors coming onto the register may well um, slow down or have a blockage mm -hmm. if yeah. there's no deal, if there's no recognition of professional qualifications in any future deal with the EU. Um, and professional regulators have been calling for some time to get the flexibility to amend the systems around how an international doctor gets onto the register. But again, this is bound up in the Medical Act, in UK law. I mean, a question really, I guess, for, for Danny Mortimer, is this something that you would be speaking to government on about the need in the face of Brexit, the rather knock-on impacts and kind of changes that may need to be made to other pieces of legislation to enable us to cope in the, in the medium to long term? Um, so, so in simple terms, yes. Um, uh, and um, you, Charlie Massey, you're, you're the kind of head of the GMC and I have, have made common cause on some of these issues with, with the government and, and have given evidence along similar lines, I think, to, um, to Parliament as well in terms of the importance of that system and also the need to give regulators um, far more discretion than they are given in the way in which the legislation is constructed at the moment. As we talked about earlier, you know, the government's ability at the moment to kind of legislate for anything um, seems fairly, uh, fairly limited and there are lots of things we'd like to take forward, whether it's the Health and Social Care Act or the way in which our, our regulators are structured. There are some choices regulators can make, of course, um, and uh, you've recently agreed, like the NMC, to change some of the way in which you handle language testing. That's really welcome because Frankly, it was insufficiently flexible the way in which you did it before. Um, the NMC are reviewing the way in which they manage both their language testing and their, their other testing, their OSCE arrangements. Um, and that feels really important for us because that does build in a delay. Uh, there are ways in which, in particular, we manage um, um, the way in which overseas doctors can uh, practice as general practitioners. The, the list system, which isn't part of the GMC, but is almost a sort of secondary regulation of general practice, which, frankly, is a nightmare and we need to sort that out. Uh, there are some things you could do to simplify some of your processes as well that I think probably you do have discretion about because <coughs> some of your applications are like that if you're an overseas doctor and the law isn't stopping you from making them a little bit slimmer. So yes, there are things the government need to do but we also think there are things regulators can do to simplify the process. Whether we were leaving the European Union or not, uh, frankly, mm -hmm. I think those, those things would be, would be needed. And that there are added complications because you've done a lot of work on the alert mechanism to exchange information about doctors moving within Europe now. It's difficult to see how that will continue without the data protection legislation. And uh, the other issue is the change in the, the time of registration of medical students in the UK and the F1, the, the links between um, uh, HEE and, and the medical schools. Um, I, I sit on medical schools council, so Sir Terence Steve Terence comes to all of our meetings and we discuss this in great in great depth every time, and there is very, very grave concern about some of these issues. Uh, we cannot see uh, an easy solution to them, unfortunately. But and th th this is an another example where actually the, the detail really matters. Yeah. So even if you take Barnier's steps of doom mm. at face value, so even if all we the UK can have, given the red lines, is Canada, the Canada agreement with the EU does have a part of it about mutual recognition of qualifications. Great, fantastic, good, we can have that. Yeah, but what does the Canada Agreement actually say? It's an agreement to have a process to discuss mutually recognising qualifications. It doesn't do anything yeah. like what European Union law does. No, nothing, and I don't think the conversation has even started no, between hasn't. Canada and the EU. Yeah. I don't think there is, and there's certainly no documentation from it that's yeah. transparent. So th this point that you're making about there's going to be a temporal crisis mm. because we haven't got that time period covered off is really important. Mm. The, 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 there is an interesting point, of course, that the, the EU regulation covers certain health professions. It doesn't cover all health professions. Well, some EU, well, EU regulation covers, covers all. all yeah. The bit that you're thinking of only covers cover, certain. Yeah. Only yes. covers certain. So we, we do have a regulator, the HCPC, which finds a way of you know, enabling us to, to appoint um, therapists and other, other allied health professionals from elsewhere in Europe and the world without the benefit that the GMC and the NMC enjoy. So, so there are, you know, it, some of that is in the, uh, clearly it would be preferable to have um, a simple agreement, but there are some choices that regulators can make as well in response to, to what's going on. And I, my understanding is if, if the law allows one of them to do it, it may well allow others to do it, though 
there are some limitations, particularly for yourselves, mm. uh, in terms of the way in which the medical act is is, um, is structured, which which limits some of your room for manoeuvre in particular. Mm. Thank you. Um, any other quick comments, questions? Or? Yes, lady. Thank you. Um, I'm a single woman. I'm from ex-Yugoslavia. And I couldn't work uh, the job which I'm doing in my country because I'm too educated. I'm working as a healthcare assistant. But this system uh, helped me to work uh, uh, as a, uh, with a bachelor as a healthcare assistant here. I like my job. But at my job, when I go there, there is a lot of black people. I don't uh, want to say uh, this is what I can see here is that working is healthy. And I don't understand why uh, more English people who are on the social benefits are not working uh, in NHS or at least for us as nursing assistant or something, <laughs> what, is, what is here wrong? And I also think that if there are black people, there are different culture. And uh, that's, that's how I see uh, the problem. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't agree with you in, in terms of that, that conclusion that you, that you reach. Um, and as I stressed to the gentleman earlier, um, the NHS has always benefited, always benefited through its 70-year history uh, from people coming from, from all over the world, from different backgrounds, different cultures, different skin colours, uh, to come and care for our, our patients. And we would be lesser uh, an institution without their contribution. Um, I do think we face a challenge going forward in terms of how we make sure that we are as attractive as possible as an employer, that we reach out to parts of our communities that perhaps don't choose to work in the NHS. Um, we do see certain sectors where uh, we see an underrepresentation of ethnic minority staff, for example. So the ambulance service, we would like more black and minority ethnic members of our, of our citizenship to come and choose to work in the ambulance service. For some reason, they don't choose to do that. Um, but we want and we benefit, and I hope we will continue to benefit from as diverse a workforce as possible. Thank you. Uh, any other, ah, uh, somebody right at the back, so I can't hear. Back row there, the gentleman. Thanks very much. I'm a doctor and who works in the NHS. Um, I was wondering whether the current crisis, as it stands, is an opportunity to um, make progress with peer-supported um, kind of workers to come forward into the NHS. I mean, I'm thinking of the example of psychiatry, where psychiatry would benefit from having pe people with lived experience working in the NHS, for example, something that's often been talked about. But those kind of roles, as it stands, my understanding is that they are not very well paid or they tend to be on a voluntary basis or third sector kind of basis. I wonder if it would be an opportunity to have a more substantive kind of um, role for people with lived experience in the NHS and, and whether this could open a debate as a potential way forward. Because the, one of the advantages of people with lived experience, particularly in psychiatry, is that their motivation is clearly there to, to assist people who yeah. have gone through similar experiences as they themselves have. Thanks yeah. very much. You're, you're absolutely right, and I think particularly the way in which um, mental health services in this country have uh, developed roles both in recovery and um, through peer support and lived experience uh, is a model potentially for other, other areas of care, particularly where we're dealing with people uh, or trying to provide care for people with longer term um, conditions. Um, the, the, in England, the, the strategy that's currently being um, consulted upon uh, around our workforce does, does pick up exactly that point that you've made. I guess the challenge is how we translate that into practice, how we invest properly in those roles. And I think you're right, how we give them um, the status and recognition that, that recognises that kind of experience and benefit they can bring to our, 
our patients and our teams. Is there, are there more questions or comments? Yes. It's, oh, yeah, okay. So uh, it's Mark from the Nuffield Trust. Um, Tanya, you touched on this earlier, but there's always a tendency for these conversations about migration and the migration the NHS needs to focus on doctors, nurses, scientists, skilled workers. <laughs> and the reality is that, that when you look forward, many of the workers we'll need, especially in social care, are unskilled workers, to use a slightly blunt term. And contrary to what we've just heard there, the reality is that the unemployment rate is very low in Britain at the moment. Um, there isn't that pool there. Um, and I just wonder if, if we have any thoughts, and this is something that certainly is a think tank I think we need to reflect on, on how we make the case to the public for the need for people who don't necessarily have high qualifications or command high salaries, um, but who are absolutely necessary to keep pace with the rising population in the services we're, we're talking about. I and mean, you know, from that point of view, Brexit is arguably a symptom of, of, in part, the failure of different sectors to make <coughs> that case as well. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Um, I think you're right. I, 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 there is that pressing need as we as we look forward. We see it particularly in our social uh, care colleagues. Um, I appreciate it's not it's not the most academically rigorous um, evidence base, but when Nick Robinson did his little photo display in Mansfield for Panorama the other week, actually he did talk about care workers. He did talk about um, nursing homes and, and community settings, and, and um, those uh, members of the public that he spoke to absolutely understood. What was required because actually that's the reality you know if, if any of you have a, a, a relative or a, a parent who's being cared for within social care in particular you will encounter people from all around the world that are providing care uh, for your for your loved ones so that, i think the public do understand uh, the questions when we ask the question in a slightly more precise way um, and it isn't i think they do understand that it's not just about nurses and doctors that it is also about the people they see in the nursing home or who are visiting their relative mm -hmm. in a, on a domiciliary basis or whatever it may be. There's much more we need to do as a sector to make that case. Um, and we need an immigration system, bluntly, that recognises that. And, and I mean, the one we have at the moment <coughs> has this crude um, methodology, as I've described, as kind of using salary as the only definition of worth. That doesn't work for us. Um, that in, isn't even working at the moment for us in terms of being able to recruit doctors who are our best paid um, staff. Um, so we need a system that, that recognises something very different in terms of how people contribute to the health and wealth uh, of, our, of our nation. Um, and I think the politicians are struggling with that. That's not unique, of course, to health and social care. That's, uh, you know, if we were talking about agriculture and food production, they are facing exactly the same challenge at probably an even bigger scale than, yeah. than we are. And there are a number of other sectors, leisure, hospitality, particularly here in London and the South East. And, and again, that's part of what I was touching on earlier in terms of I think one of the challenges for us as a sector is also to make common cause with others uh, in terms of making this case that, that we are clearly special. I know we're special, but there's a risk that we, we hold how special we are too dearly and we don't recognise that actually we do share some problems and challenges with other parts of the, other parts of the economy. And, and if, if I may, you, you touched on a really important element of, of the answer to, or part of the answer to, to Mark's question which is that it, it is different, and, and this is where, again, Brexit is probably a symptom. It's different in different parts of the United Kingdom. So th this feels different in London because London is already a very cosmopolitan city. We already talked about Scotland and how Scotland's identity as a, an open nation is very different. It, this is particularly challenging for the parts of the country like where I come from, the north of England, where the, the, the felt experience of local communities just does feel really different, that they perceive others as very th threatening. Yeah. Even if those others are caring for their elderly <coughs> relatives. Thank you. And just maybe time for just one more in terms of somebody else. I think the some, the gentleman at the back. Is it? Yeah. Uh, Murray Robinson, a, a retired GP. I'd just like to take up the point of living experience is becoming available, as, as you were suggesting. We have potentially an enormous unemployed, highly experienced workforce, namely folk who've recently retired, who have an enormous range of experience. If there was an arrangement that would allow them to have enough money to cover their expenses or some time of tax concerns, 
concession, I expect a lot of folk would very willingly contribute to the health service because so much of our community has seen the health service as something that pulls us together. And that talent is being wasted. Um, <coughs> two, <coughs> two things there, if I may. I mean, I, I think the first is that um, we're also, um, we're getting better. We've seen the proportion of people who retire from frontline roles in the health service and then return to work um, in the health service and, in fact, access their pension and return. We're, we're seeing the proportion of retirees choosing to make that, do that increase. I think the <coughs> second bit is that um, there clearly is an important um, change that we need to make in terms of how we engage with carers and, and volunteers, um, you, whatever their background may be. Uh, I guess the caution we would feel as, as employers is that, that actually what we want to do is also, of course, make sure that we have a, a, subst a sufficient substantive workforce to meet the, the needs of the population that we're, we're caring for. But, but again, the workforce strategy that I mentioned uh, briefly a few moments ago um, envisages exactly that work in terms of carers and volunteers and, and how the NHS could, could think very differently uh, about how it engages with, with people who've got that potential to make the contribution you highlight. But that will only work for this generation, mm. because it's only your generation, with respect, who have retired with the kind of pensions that will allow you to give that time yeah. for free. Yeah. The, the generation that follows will not have pensions that will allow that. My, I mean, my, my key point rem remains the same, that it's well past the time where we should be accepting general statements from our government about how it will generally be fine. We need detail at this stage. Well, I'd completely echo that. The treaties exist. Anything that is agreed has to be compliant with the treaties. And to ask for something that is not compliant with the treaties is just a fantasy. And to get into a situation where the European Union has produced detailed legal texts, but more than that, it has produced notices to operators, notices to stakeholders, mm. in a whole range of sectors which are incredibly detailed. And nothing, nothing comparable has come from the United Kingdom government. And what has come has been deliberately engineered to be ambiguous to keep the governing party together. Mm. And that, frankly, at this stage, is utterly disgraceful and regardless of your view on Brexit, whether you want to leave or remain, the biggest issue that comes out of this is the complete and total incompetence of our political class and this is not a party political issue because both of the major parties have a huge responsibility. It's different in Scotland, Philippa. <laughs> um, I think that point about specificity and, and the fact that actually 20 months on we, we all need as employers, we particularly need uh, much more concrete proposals to, to engage with and to try and help um, shape. Yeah. And again, that wouldn't be if, uh, you know, when I meet colleagues from other sectors, that's exactly the same point that they're, that they're making as well. And, and I think that's becoming an increasing source of concern. I think the second area, and we, we've touched on it in particular, is that there are a set of things, um, particularly in the kind of, um, the industries that work most closely with our sector, so life sciences, pharmaceuticals, tech, there are some real issues for, for, for those colleagues. And, and you know, in, in terms of that ugly step where we, we crash out, and um, you know, th there are some real issues for that sector, and then some real costs that would be incurred uh, for us as a service and for, for the public. 